wonderful grace. Be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Confusion abounds in the churches today as they are carried about by every wind of doctrine because they have forgotten truth. The Bible is the word of Almighty God. We need not alter it, adjust it, or correct it. We need only to believe it. Therein lays the treasure which is open to us. Yes, the key to understanding the scriptures and which unlocks the riches of God's grace is found in 2 Timothy 2.15. Study, show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I see a brand new life, glorious peace, the end is cried. And then I cry, what wonderful grace, what wonderful grace. If you've been watching the television or reading the newspaper or, or aware of what's going on in the world in the last few weeks and months, you know that the tr there's a tremendous attention that we're placing again on the Middle East. Uh, the invasion of Kuwait by Iraq and the subsequent deployment of American troops to Saudi Arabia ha has brought our, our, our attention, focus back on that part of the world that that for many decades, especially in modern history, has been a, been a, a seething, boiling pot, a cauldron, as it were, that seems to at any moment be willing to erupt into uh, warfare and bloodshed. I have a clipping here from the Chicago Tribune. It says that the convergence of nations poised for war in the Middle East and the threat it poses to Israel have kindled curiosity, fear, and even bliss among Americans who see it fitting the Bible's description of the eve of Armageddon, the battle that ends the world. The prospects of Armageddon, the article says, beginning in the Middle East, has sent ripples of emotion from California to New York. And I read that to say that I'm aware of the fact, and I, as I'm sure you are, that there's a tremendous interest in what the Bible has to say. I was just flying in an airplane just the other day, coming home from a a, a Bible conference, and a man, I, I had my Bible and I was reading it, and I had the tray open, you know, and I, I, I back down and my Bible sitting on it, I was sitting next to the window, and I was just reading uh, to pass the, the time as I flew, and a man sitting next to me reached over and tapped me and said, say, does that book have anything to say about what's happening over in the Middle East right now? And, of course, I could say, yes, it does have a lot to say about what's going on in the world and about what, what's going to happen in the Middle East. And I, I say that just to say that there's a tremendous interest in that. And we want to study about that. I'd like to look at the Word of God with you. And, and I realize that you see, if you watch television and you watch ministries that teach the Word and that, that are interested in things like that, you'll see all kinds of ideas. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a preacher. I'm a Bible teacher. I... Uh, I train men to teach, uh, to teach and preach the Word of God. I preach and teach myself and pastor a local church. And I've, I've noticed that, that there's a tremendous amount of interest in, in taking the things that happen in the world and aligning them and putting them together with what happens in the Word of God. Well, is peace in the Middle East possible? Will it happen? Will we see it? Are the things going on over there today, do they have anything to do with what the Bible says is going to take place? Well, what does the Bible say about it? I'm not interested in reading the, uh, the clippings from the newspaper. That isn't the issue. You'll never prove anything by reading clippings from the newspaper. They're not the issue. The issue is what God says in His book. Now, if you're going to understand what, what's going on in the Middle East and what, what, what the Bible talks about when it talks about going on in the Middle, the, the, the Middle East and, and the fulfilling of Bible prophecy, and I say to you in, in the prophetic scripture that the, the Middle East, especially Palestine and uh, the area that, that we're focused in over on today in, in Iraq, that area is the stage upon which the end time events that are described in the Word of God will take place. There is a, a time schedule involved in that. There is a calendar, a prophetic calendar. 
time schedule in the Word of God that's very important and that is critical to be understood. If you're going to understand what's going on in the Middle East in the context of Bible prophecy, you have to understand the time schedule of end time events. So take your Bible, if you will, and turn with me to the book of Daniel, chapter number 9. The book of Daniel is a book that describes the, gives the details of, uh, of, of how the God's prophetic program is going to come to culmination, how it's going to be brought to a conclusion. And in the, in the book of Daniel, there are a number of, uh, uh, of things that are laid out for us that if we, if, we, if we can understand each one of them individually and then put them together, we'll have a whole picture. In Daniel chapter 9, you have a passage that describes the time events. Uh, it's sort of like the timeline, the calendar uh, upon which the end time events will take place. Let me read for you, beginning at verse number 24 of Daniel 9. Now, it's important that we study the passage, not just that we talk about it, but that we actually study what it says. So let's read it first. Daniel is told, and, and of course Daniel has been reading the scripture. He had the scripture there in Babylon as he was in captivity. Nebuchadnezzar had taken uh, Jerusalem and had, and, and had taken Israel and had taken Daniel and many of his countrymen captive. They'd been 70 years in the Babylonian captivity. Daniel had been studying his Bible. And he read in the Word of God how that God said they would be there 70 years. And after 70 years they would be restored back to their land. And so he begins to do what Leviticus 26 says that he should do. They were under the fifth cycle of judgment that God had, had, uh, had uh, pronounced upon the nation Israel if they rebelled against him. And that fifth cycle of judgment was national deportation and, and, and captivity in the hands of a strange nation. That had happened to Israel for 70 years. had been in, in Babylon in captivity. Uh, Babylon, by the way, is, is located in modern-day Iraq, the old ancient city of Babylon. Uh, the kingdom of Babylon was the area that we call Iraq today. And the ancient city of Babylon is, was located about 40 to 50 miles south of present-day, modern-day Baghdad. If you look on a modern map of Iraq, you'll see a little town about 40 to 50 miles south of Baghdad that's called Hilla, H-I-L-L-A. And that is the city uh, that, that in Scripture is called Babylon. That's ancient Babylon. That's the site of ancient Babylon located on the Euphrates River. The name's been changed, but the site is the same. Uh, Daniel and Israel were there in captivity. He sees that the, the, the Scripture has been fulfilled, the 70 years have been accomplished, and he begins to do what the Scripture requires of the nation Israel for them to be restored back to their land. As he begins to confess the sins of his people and do just what John the Baptist called Israel to do in, 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 in his ministry, repent uh, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Daniel begins to confess his people and to repent for his nation. And as he does that, God answers his prayer and sends him a man by the name, an angel by the name of Gabriel, with a message, with a vision about the time element of the restoration of the nation Israel and the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says in Daniel 9, 24, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy, thy holy city. 70 weeks are determined upon Israel, Daniel's people, and upon thy holy city, that's the city of Jerusalem, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in the everla in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. All of those things are to take place when Jesus Christ comes back to this earth and sets up his kingdom. He, he, he'll, make an end of, he'll finish transgression. Uh, sin will be brought to a full, and he will destroy... He will, uh, uh, bring it to, to a, a, a culmination, and then he'll set up a kingdom wherein he'll rule and reign in righteousness. He'll make an end of sins. Uh, he'll, he'll, he'll make reconciliation for iniquity. Uh, the new covenant will be placed in effect, and he'll blot out the sins of, uh, of the nation. He'll seal up the psalm and uh, the, the vision and the prophecy. In other words, he's going to bring the thing to fulfillment, and he's going to anoint the most holy. He's going to sit in the temple and, uh, and reign as a priest upon his throne. In other words, all these things take place when Jesus comes back and sets up his kingdom. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment, watch, to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The streets shall be built again and the wall even in troublous time. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off but not for himself. 
And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and under the end of the war desolations are determined. And he, that is the prince that shall come, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Now, there is a total of 70 weeks in, in the passage. He says that 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. And then he identifies the, the carrying out of those 70 weeks, how they're going to progress. He starts the 70 weeks with a, with a point back here that he says from the commandment to go forth and, be, and rebuild Jerusalem under, uh, under Messiah the Prince over here. Uh, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem... And, uh, uh, to restore and build Jerusalem under Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. In other words, from the point when they, when they get the commandment to go back and restore and rebuild Jerusalem to the point over here where Messiah shows up and is identified is going to be a total of 62 weeks. Now those 62 weeks, I'm sorry, I got that backwards, going to be a total of 69 weeks. That 69 week period is going to be divided into two sections. First there's going to be a, a seven week period and then the, the wall of the city. In other words the city of Jerusalem is going to be, be restored. The wall is going to be built. The protection is going to be placed up and it's going to take seven weeks to do it. Then there's going to be 62 weeks. 62 and 7, that's 69. After the 62 weeks, Messiah the prince shall be cut off. Then the prince that shall come will, will come. There will be a war and so forth. And then over here after that, there's going to be a one-week period over here. And that's going to be the 70th week. So you have 69 weeks. Then you have some events that take place in here. And then the 70th week over there. Now what are we talking about? It's easy to lay that much of it out. 69 weeks. First there's seven and the walls rebuilt. Then there's 62 more weeks and Messiah the prince is cut off but not for himself. And then there's, there's the, the, the people of the prince that shall come will destroy the city, destroy Jerusalem. It's, one, it's rebuilt here. It's destroyed again here. Destroy the sanctuary. Then there's a great war. And then the prince that shall come who turns out to be the Antichrist shows up and confirms the covenant with many for one week. At the end of that period of time, Jesus Christ comes back, and when he does, he comes back and he sets up his kingdom over here. So the kingdom reign of Christ is said to Daniel. Daniel is standing back over here, of course. And when Daniel looks down through, through time and he sees the prophetic program laying itself out, he sees a time schedule. And that time schedule looks like that. Now you say, well, how do we put some time to it? Well, I'll go back to verse 24. Seventy weeks undetermined upon thy people. Now what is a week? Well, you say, well, a week is, is, is uh, seven days. Well, come back with me to Genesis chapter number 29. And let me remind you about something in the Bible. In the Bible, the Word of God sets up its own system of definitions and terms. It's, it, it defines its own terms. It sets up its own way of, of using things. It's always important when you study something in any kind of a discipline of study, in any epistemology of study, you want, to, you want to find out how terms are used within that system and area of expertise and study. When you study the Bible, you want to do that. A week is a, is a group of seven somethings, seven things. But it, does, it doesn't have to be a week of days. It can be a week of days. But it can also be a week of years. A week of days is seven days. A week of years is seven years. Illustration. Genesis chapter 29, verse number 20. Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days for the love he had to her. You remember Jacob loved Rachel, and he served seven years to her father Laban to get to earn, to, to merit Rachel as his wife. Verse 27, verse 26 it says, Laban said, It must not be so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Fulfill her week, and we will give this thee, this also for the service which thou shalt serve me, yet seven years. And Jacob did so and fulfilled her week. Week of what? Week of years. Not a, you see, a week can be, as we generally use it, a week of days. But you can also have a week of years. And when you come to Daniel chapter 9, 
And you see when he says seven weeks are determined. The seven weeks, 70 weeks here, seven here, 62, making 69, and then one left. Those weeks turn out to be not weeks of days, but weeks of years. And the way you know that is this last week over here is a seven-year period of time. Well, if that last week is seven years, how long is a week? A week is seven years long. So 69 weeks back here would be a total of 483 years. Now, that's not hard to figure that out. I mean, you know, you, you just work the numbers out, and it works out that way. Over here, you have the seven years is divided into 42 months and 42 months. It's divided into 1,260 days and 1,260 days. That means a month is, a, is uh, these 42 months to equal 1,260 days. This week is divided in the middle like that. And half of that week is 1,260 days. Half of it is 1,260 days. Half of it is 42 months. Half of it's 42 months. That is, a month in this thing is going to equal 30 days equals a month. And so when you figure all those numbers are all laid out for you in the Word of God. Well, then you know how long the, the week is. Then you can figure how long the time schedule is. Now go back to Daniel chapter number 9, verse number 25. Know therefore and understand from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. In other words, this period from here, from the going forth of the commandment to, to, to go back and restore Jerusalem to the time Messiah the prince comes over here is going to be a total of 69 weeks divided into two sections, one where the city is rebuilt, and then there's a gap in there, uh, not a gap, but a long period of time of just silence. Get two passages in your hand. Get Nehemiah chapter number 1. Nehemiah chapter number 1. And uh, the book of Luke chapter number 19. Nehemiah chapter 1. And Luke chapter number 19. Now, folks, the way you study the Bible is you just study it. You compare the passages, you look at the verses, and you find passages that describe one another and that complement one another and that explain one another. Nehemiah chapter 2, from the commandment to go forth and rebuild Jerusalem, here's the passage. Nehemiah chapter 2. And it came to pass in the month Nisan, in the 20th uh, a year of Artaxerxes the king, you notice how clearly he lays all that down for you. He gives you the exact dating. Now, I'm not a chronologist, and I didn't live back then, but I know what they say. They, the idea is that uh, that's about 450 B.C. He gives Nehemiah the commandment to go back and build. Verse number 5, I said unto the king, For it pleased the king, and if, thy, if, if it pleased the king, and if thy servant hath found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulcher, and I, that I may build it, build the city. And the king said unto me, For how long shall thy journey be? And when, it, when will thou return? So it pleased the king to send me. And I set him a time. The commandment to go forth and rebuild Jerusalem is, is given to Nehemiah by Artaxerxes back here somewhere around 450 B.C. In Nehemiah chapter number 2. Luke chapter number 19. Luke chapter number 19. Verse number 41. And when he, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, over here, Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry, he's coming to Jerusalem. And he's coming down off the mount, looking over the city. When he came near, he beheld the city and wept over it. He's coming into Jerusalem to go to Calvary to die. And, it sa and he says this as he looks over the city and weeps and, and, and with a broken heart over it. If thou hast known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things that belong unto thy peace, but now they hid from thine eyes. Now if you'll study Josephus and you'll study the historians, you'll find that from the commandment back here in Nehemiah chapter 2 to the event recorded in Luke chapter number 19 verse 41 is exactly to the day 483 years of 360 days per year. That's what a prophetic day is. That's what these days, our months, 
have 30 days, have September, April, June, and November, and all the rest have 31 except February, which has 28, and leap year has 29. We've got a, a lot of different numbers. In Bible prophecy, a month is 30 days. And a year, 12 months, is 360 days. And 483 years of prophetic years is exactly 173,880 days. And that's exactly how many days there are between Nehemiah chapter 2 and Luke chapter number 19. So what happens is this time period, this 69 years, is fulfilled right there. Now go back to Daniel chapter 9 and notice what's to take place after that. Daniel 9 verse 27, and after, after three score and two weeks, after this, these weeks go on here, shall Messiah, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, be cut off, but not for himself. Well, you say, what is that? Well, come with me to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter number 53, verse number 8 talking about the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says in Isaiah 53, 8, He, that's the Lord Jesus, shall be taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare His generation? For He shall be cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was He stricken. Jesus Christ dies at Calvary, just as the prophecy says, just on time with the prophetic scripture. Do you understand, my friend, that you literally could date the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ by Old Testament Bible prophecy just using the book of Daniel? The people that were alive when the Lord Jesus Christ was born, they knew that he was coming. How do you think the wise men were looking for his star in the east? How did they know what Numbers 24 said would happen and when it happened know that that's what it was? They had the time element there. Why was Sinan? Why Simeon? And why were Anna? And why were all those people in Jerusalem at the temple in expectation waiting for the Messiah to come? Because they understood, they could date from Daniel's prophecy the time right there when he'd be cut off. They knew he couldn't enter his ministry. Numbers 4, he's going to be the, the priest of the Lord. He can't enter his ministry until he's 30. So they could back up from that point 30 years and know that somewhere around that time he had to show up. You can literally date his birth within three years ahead of time, figuring it that way. The 69 weeks are over, then Messiah is cut off. The Lord Jesus Christ is crucified. Then the prophecy says, The people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city. Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. The temple is going to be destroyed. There's going to be a tremendous war take place. And then the Antichrist is going to show up. And we'll talk more about him next week. Then the Antichrist is going to confirm the covenant with many for one week. And it says in the midst of the week he'll cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And in the middle of that week he's going to, going to come in and declare himself to be God and declare himself to be the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's the fake. He's the phony. He's the one that tries to usurp the authority. And in the end of that Jesus Christ comes back and destroys him and sets up his kingdom. Now, all of the prophecy up to this point has been fulfilled. All of the prophecy from that point onward awaits fulfillment and has not been fulfilled. And when that prophetic clock is ticking, that's what's going to be taking place. Now, come with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. Don't miss what we're going to go over here now. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. Don't you miss this passage. That's the, this is the calendar that prophecy says is going to take place. Up to this point here has been fulfilled, has taken place. This is what wait, awaits fulfillment. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 13, Paul says, Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, talking about the day of his wrath over here, shall not come except there come a falling away first. The man of sin be revealed, that son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That's right here. Now verse number 5. Remember you not that when I was with you I told you these things? But now you know, watch carefully, what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now, now letteth will be let, will let until he be taken out of the way. There is something today, Paul says, that is withholding this thing from, from being fulfilled. 
You see, there's something today. On, he says, you know what withholdeth. There is something going on today that has interrupted this prophetic program and has called a halt to it and has stopped it from being fulfilled. It was coming along, everything took place, Christ is crucified, and then all of a sudden, bang, 2,000 years have been stuck in there, and that fellow hadn't showed, the Antichrist hadn't showed up yet. And Paul says, you people at Thessalonica know what's withholding. You know what's holding back the prophetic program. He says, you know that the mystery of iniquity doth already work. You see, God has a prophetic program, something that he's been making known and and, and, and prophesied and told about, but he also has a secret program, a purpose that he never told anyone about. He kept it secret, didn't put it in prophecy until he revealed it from heaven to the Apostle Paul and through Paul to you and me today in the Word of God. And the present dispensation of the grace of God in which we live today is holding back the final fulfillment of the prophetic program. Rather than God today focusing on the establishment uh, uh, of His kingdom on the earth, rather than the Antichrist ruling and holding sway, God God Almighty today is holding that, that, that program back. He's keeping the Antichrist from showing up. He's keeping the resolution, the fulfillment, and the outworking of the prophetic program from coming to pass because He's the God is doing something else. He's interrupted prophecy, set the prophetic program aside, and the day is forming the church, the body of Christ, during the dispensation of the grace of God, not route reclaiming real estate and setting up political kingdoms, but rather forming a spiritual body of believers who, who are believers of all, of all kind of stripes and hue of all nations and races and, and religions, placing Sinners of all kinds that will believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and rely exclusively upon Him, placing us in one spiritual body called the body of Christ, blessing us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places, and there is the issue about what God's doing today. You see, we're faced today with the issue of our personal accountability before God and the fact that we today have been given an opportunity to be a part of a heavenly program. And the battle today is not on the earth over the planet. The battle today, Paul says, is in the heavenly places as God is forming this spiritual body of believers. Well, our time's gone. We're going to have to quit. You be with us next time and we'll go on with this. Wonderful grace, what wonderful grace.